Welcome once again to Stay Alive with Church Alive. And this is your host and president of Church Alive Development Corporation and the proud pastor of Church Alive Community Church. And for the last 30 years, we've brought you quality information, resources, and services that have improved your lifestyle. And once again, we're going to deal with some issues that we put aside many times we don't even want to discuss them. And it's, what we're talking about is racism. And racism and how does it affect the family's health and the social life and how we live. And we haven't gotten into this subject in a long time, but we thank you. Uh, the uh, Institute for Family Health and Brown's Health Reach uh, for making this program uh, possible. And so we want you to um, just sit back and take back, take in this information that I feel that will be able to direct your life and how to relate to one another and how to really understand what racism is all about, how it affects all matters and all parts of our lifestyle. And so I would like to introduce at this time uh, the Institute, I'm sorry, representing the Institute of Family Health, Brown Health Reach, uh, Immaculate Marata, and she is the program assistant coordinator for the Institute of Family Health, Brown Health Reach. Welcome to Church Alive. Thank you, Bishop Burkett. Thank you. We are happy here uh, to be here again uh, with you and invite the audience to be part of this important uh, movement and conversation with us at Bronx South Reach about racism and our family's health and really connecting the dots. Um, we are excited to be here to discuss why this conversation on racism matter, race and racism, the impact it has on our health and to really share what we are doing as a Bronx community-led coalition to address this public health crisis. And I'll explain more on this. So racism is a public health crisis. And as a group, we found that it was urgent to have more houses of worship, understand the role it has in our lives, to identify it so that we can be the vessel within the community and share this knowledge why this important this is important to us and why there's a health crisis in the Bronx the Bronx continues to be the unhealthiest county in New York state in terms of health outcomes and to address this as a response the the hashtag not 62 the campaign for healthy Bronx was created and formed a couple years back it is a call to action to improve the overall health health status of the Bronx by addressing the social and economic environment, health behaviors, clinical care, physical environment, through the collaboration partnerships across multiple sectors in the Bronx. So is health about race? Yes. It, it has an impact on every aspect of our lives. Racialized communities, as we mentioned in our first part, are more likely to live in food deserts, polluted areas, have lower quality health care. It is important that to understand that racism is embedded into every facet and crevice of America. American society was developed in the notion of race in its early formation to justify um, the economic system of capitalism and the institution of forced labor, especially the enslavement of African-American people. So, Racism is woven into every fabric of American society. In 2020, um, just a little excerpt of what we are doing with this work, our Bronx faith-based partners and community leaders came together to launch Racism in Our Family's Health, Connecting the Dots, focus on understanding initially the COVID-19 pandemic race gap and the faith-based perspective and the role in addressing racism. And then con subsequently, throughout the years, we've had different topics, and this year we intend to do the same, um, highlighting mental health and what in 2021. And in 2022, we also provided a training resources of how people in the community, houses of worship, can lead the conversation on race and have the tools to do so. Last week, we had part, part one. In part one, we discussed uh, 
racism and that there are many different types of racism. And then we also uh, deal with racism and within the, the houses of worship. And we opened up an area so, uh, that we never thought we'd ever have to go into when we consider racism, because it's always a, you know, a national thing, but it has become now a community problem. And that community problem has caused poor health in the Bronx. And to get to, the, to that point, I want you to explain 62. Yes. So thank you, uh, Bishop Burkett. So the hashtag now 62, the campaign for a healthy Bronx, is a call to action, as I mentioned before, to improve the overall health of Bronx residents. So this is a report uh, every year the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute with funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation releases this report called the uh, County Health Rankings and Roadmaps Report. The, the, the rankings, they provide an data, um, data and evidence and guidance of where we're at as far as the counties and other counties in the states, right? It provides guidance and stories to support the community-led efforts and improve health equity. For example, in this year, um, the Bronx uh, was, again, continues to be ranked. Out of all the counties, we are in last place. And how does that translate when you say, what does that mean in terms of health outcomes? For example, the data shows that 21% of Bronx residents have poor health compared to 12% of the United States. Mm -hmm. So we're not doing so great. And then 32% of Bronx adults are obese, the highest prevalence rate in New York City. And, and lastly, just to just highlight some of the things that uh, really resonated with me, the Bronx unemployment rate is 13.6% higher than the New York state of 6.9%. So we're not doing so well in many aspects. But, uh, and, and lastly, I'll leave you with this from what the NOS 62, hashtag NOS 62 campaign tends to do. It's a grassroots campaign to communicate as widely uh, as possible the fact of the, what the ranking is and what it means just to share that information so we can get a movement and support from the entire community who is are living through these, um, I guess, circumstances now. Okay, we're gonna take a break and then we're gonna come back to how is racism making us sick and how is racism affecting our well-being? And uh, we have uh, two guests that are experiencing it and especially coming from the faith base of, of, this, of the Bronx. And we're going to be dealing with those two questions. Matter of fact, it's the third part of the question. How do you achieve equity goals as your organization, as an individual? Now, how, how does that racism affect you personally? And you're going to hear uh, from those very important individuals, and you're going to hear from Reverend Powers. Uh, Reverend Powers is... Let me get titles all straightened out. And you're going to also hear from uh, Janice Gordin, and I will give them a professional introduction right after this commercial. Thank you. I know what you're thinking. I need a job. Well, I've been there. I've been there. But you got to keep going. You just need the right skills. Find an apprenticeship. I found a course online. You can do this. You will find something. You will find something new. Our guests to answer those two questions are Pastor David Powers, Pastor David Powers is a Roman Catholic Church, and um, they are doing some real community work, and they're focusing on racism from a, a faith-based perspective. And then we also have uh, Denise Gordine, and she is the Health and Wellness Coordinator at the Tremont United Methodist Church, and they are here today uh, to bring you some quality information and that will help to improve your understanding about racism and how it affects our health. And so the first person we're going to introduce at this time is Denise Gordine. Denise Gordine, welcome to this very special program. Good afternoon, uh, Bishop Burkett, and thank you for having us today. Um, 
it's Tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and and the work of the church and uh, and then we'll go into the questions right um i am a member of tremont united methodist church in the bronx i have been a member at tremont united methodist church um in more years than i probably want to acknowledge at this point in time and i am the health and wellness chairperson as uh maranta stated as uh Ms. Maranta stated um, just briefly that we have a real crisis here in the Bronx. Not only is it a crisis in the Bronx, but it's a crisis throughout the United States. But just to, to focus on the Bronx, we are 62 out of 62 counties in New York State for health outcomes. And this is not something that we, we speak of with pride. This is an unfortunate and almost a shame that we are 62 in terms of health outcomes. And when you think in terms of health outcomes, you think of blood pressure elevations, you think of diabetes, you think of carcinoma, you think of infant and um, maternal mortality, you think of obesity that she stated, and then you think of emotional and mental health. We are in the midst of a crisis in terms of our emotional mental and psychological health. There has been an uptick and an increase in suicide. There are people that are experiencing anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation. And all of these things are correlated and related to the institutional and structural racism that is indeed a part of our society and our community here. All right, give me some examples in that area. Well, when you think in terms of, I'll give you an example. If you turn on your television at any time during the day or the night, one of the first things you'll see is violence. Oftentimes we'll see depictions or pictures of unarmed black men being shot, being killed by law enforcement. This is an ongoing issue. And you ask, well, what? how does that impact the everyday John Doe, Mary Doe. I'll tell you how it impacts. It provides stress, it provides depression, it provides anxiety, it provides a feeling of unsafety and being overwhelmed. And that's compounded day after day after day. And the average Joe was expected to, after seeing a repeat of these things, to go back to work the next day and, you know, just pretend that he's normal. That's not normal because this stress and this trauma impacts our brain. And it, 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 um, it impedes our ability to have a normal, happy, functioning life. Right. Now, do you find out that it also the uh, adds to the poor health. Well, we think about ourselves, but what about the medical services that are provided for us? The lack of medical service or medical care, and where is it coming from? Because we know that if there a white person and a black person goes to a hospital, we realize from last week's program, okay, thanks to our, our Reverend Kendricks, that there's a difference. Right. Clearly, there, we found that there's a disparity. There's a racial disparity in the services that are provided to people of color as opposed to people that uh, identify as white. Um, when you look at the when you look at the type of and quality of medical services and mental health services that are available in certain parts of the Bronx, they're not on par with services that are provided in some of the other areas of, of the city and in Manhattan. And then there's also a socioeconomic component that goes as well. Basically, you may get what you pay for. And so sometimes you have people that are poverty stricken and they're downtrodden and they not, may not be able to pay for the quality of services. So they're not available in our community. When you think in terms of the issue of food insecurity. The South Bronx has some of the most, the highest rates of food insecurity in the state. When you, and, and it's a shame because the South Bronx is also home to the Hunts Point Market that 
produces the largest amount of, uh, of uh, fruits and vegetables and produce, yet unfortunately these fruits and vegetables and produce are not uh, available in our communities. We don't have the high-end supermarkets that would provide good nutrition, mm -hmm. fresh fruits and produce like some of the other areas in New York City. And so all of these issues go into poor health outcomes for people of the Bronx. And as I stated before, we have had the, the dubious distinction of being 62 for multiple years now. And the hashtag not 62 um, initiative is working diligently to try to get us to get off of this 62 and provide healthy foods, um, quality health care, fresh um, opportunities to walk in, in, in parks and things like that that we don't have. But we're committed and we are willing to do as much as we can to see good outcomes for all Bronx sites. Thank you so much. We're going to come back uh, to the question, but at this time I'd like to introduce uh, our Pastor uh, Powers. Uh, Pastor Powers, how do the church responding to this inequity? One of the first things, almost everybody in this show is going to be Christian or a person of faith. Remember that one of the highest moral values we have is the dignity of the human person. Now, sometimes uh, an individual might say, oh, I'm racially colorblind. But when he says that, that's really just trying to be politically correct. The fact of the matter is we do see race. We do see skin color. And unfortunately, there was a time in our church's history, this is not a good one, in which we had the black church, the Hispanic church, the white church. We, we separated even our own churches into racial groups. Now I'm glad to say there's a lot less of that. You go into many of the churches of faith in the Bronx and you're going to see people of many different skin colors. An individual might be able to ignore a person's skin color, but, and this is something the churches need to be aware of, society as a whole is not. We're getting better, but we're not there. Uh, sometimes individuals make a mistake of saying that racism equals racial prejudice, and that's not the case. Racial prejudice is a component, but racism has a second aspect, racial prejudice plus systemic institutional power. And this is something that the churches can help address in to be able to move on a systemic level into one that is being able to say, look, I'm seeing people equal. People of color, as a social group, they don't possess the societal institutional power that has oppressed them for many years and that uh, white people do not have as a group. So let me give you an example. You mentioned before uh, individuals. Now, I'm a fairly large in person. If I'm not wearing a collar, I could be intimidating. About a year and a half ago, I was in another part of the Bronx, and I was walking the street at night dressed just in civilian attire. I was there, and there was a couple of black teenagers who were walking ahead of me. All of a sudden, police car comes running around, and we're saying, okay, what's happened? The police, as you're familiar, in New York City has this stop and frisk policy. So the two black teenagers were stopped and frisked. And I just continued on my merry little way. You know, is this an example where we still have the systemic racism? Now, if I'm walking in the street at night, we all might be nervous. If I am an individual and I am saying at any point in time, I could be stopped, searched, frisked, that's gonna raise my anxiety. That's going to cause health issues. If I'm feeling fairly safe in the neighborhood, I'm going to have a much lower feeling of that. And this is something I think we need to be aware of. Statistic. I don't know how many people know this. In New York City, you know that black people are incarcerated at a rate that is 11.6 times higher than white people. And according to the John Jay College data, 
Black and Hispanics make up 90% of the prison population, even though they make up only 52% of the population in New York City. If you've got people aware of that, if you've got people who are thinking, because I'm Black, because I'm Hispanic, am I likely to be thrown into jail for no good reason? That's going to raise your anxiety level. And this is something I think that the churches have a responsibility of being able to say, we must address this. We must preach about it. We must talk about it. We must say that health is important and that racism, racial prejudice, plus systemic is something that we just can't tolerate in this day and age. Again, we're getting better, but we're not there yet. And because we're not there yet, this has to be an issue that the church has addressed. Remember, the dignity of the person is something that is so extremely important for those of us who are people of faith, for those of us who say that we are Christians and we want to acknowledge that color is an important part of celebrating dignity and diversity. We recognize every person is different. I want you to see me for who I am and not for who you might perceive me to be. Now, do we all have bias? Absolutely. If I see a six foot five black male walking down the street, real good chance I'm going to say, do you play basketball? <laughs> no, that's right. a bias <laughs> within it. And sometimes we don't realize that. And um, if you have uh, names of children, you know, sometimes certain racial groups tend to use uh, certain names for their children that are different from other racial groups. So if I run into a parishioner and their children are named in what I consider to be unusual names, I might say, oh, how nice. <laughs> and they know perfectly well <laughs> that right. I'm not saying what I might be thinking. And this is just part of the everyday bias that we all experience. Thank you so much. All right. That, that was a real insight and um, a welcome insight. I and mean, I'm hoping that our viewers are uh, taking all of that in from our father, David Powers. And at this time, we're going to take a break, and then you're going to hear from um, <clears throat> the person who's really coordinating everything. And I, I know our heart is in that. And then Maculata, uh, Maranta, and she's going to tell you how you can get engaged and move this, not from just a meeting, a show, but into a movement. We're going to take a break. and will be right back. If you love them enough to do this, surely you'll check NHTSA.gov slash the right seat to make sure they're in the right car seat. Okay, we um, are blessed to have the coordinator of the of the special project. And I believe that she's opened up a box and you can't close it now. We have to go forward. And so I'd like to uh, pass the, the baton over to uh, Immaculata uh, Maranta. To, to tell you how you can be part of this movement. Yes, thank you, uh, Bishop Burkett. Um, so as far as this work that we're doing together as a Bronx-led coalition, a grassroots um, effort, this conversation on race and racism is important and, and must be had so we can redesign the leadership because you might be thinking, so what do I do with this information? We can talk about race and racism, but why? It is helpful to make sure that we know how to identify it as um, Pastor Powers and Ms. Gordine was mentioning, so we can redesign the leadership and then work against structural oppression. Um, and then who do we bring to the table? Who can we engage to make uh, either help us with decision-making and have an actual impact in our everyday lives. So um, I invite you and everybody here um, in this audience to uh, join us. Uh, we have a uh, annual meeting to discuss these topics. Well, we, our goal is to actually invite experts and leaders from the community, people who have experienced race and ra uh, racism, 
who uh, really have something to give to the community. Um, so our next event um, where we're going to be um, bringing these experts is we are tentatively scheduled for September 15th. But in order for this event to happen, we invite everybody here to join our virtual faith-based outreach initiative meetings. These happen the last Tuesday of every month, and these are virtual from 4 to 6 p.m. And uh, a group of our houses of worship and community leaders come together, and they are the ones who plan, lead, and decide who's, the, who's going to be part of this event and what information we want to bring to the community or what are my concerns, right? You can find more information on and updates on this at our Bronx Health Reach Facebook page. You can also visit us at our um, website and uh, find us and uh, please join us. We are also uh, looking into supporting the New York Health Act, which would provide a universal insurance coverage with no copay, deductibles or premiums. It's a single payer system that will guarantee New Yorkers, regardless of income or job status, to focus on their health and their health care and non-medical bills. So that's something that we're actually looking forward as a group, supporting and doing more of. So yes, I invite you to come to our monthly virtual meeting so you can help us with the planning, be up to date on what we're doing and what you can do. So we can also bring this event at a larger scale in September um, as well. It's clear that racism is making us sick. It's truly an issue. It has reached epidemic and crisis proportions. We've been given some preliminary information about how it's making us sick. Now, each of us has to determine what we're going to do with this information. Are we going to be a change agent? Or are we going to sit idly and just let things go by? I have made the decision that I am going to be the change that I'm looking for, because if not me, then who? Thank you. You're welcome. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Amen means it is done. Let's do it. Let's get engaged. Yes. Take down the telephone numbers as they come up and be, make that telephone call. It is important. It's important that you do it now. Thank you and uh, we, for allowing us to come into your homes and we wanna let you know that we love you with the love of the Lord. God bless you. God, but in all ways.